There is very few popes in history that would really resonate with this powerful passage of Peter being made the first pope of the church and that authority being passed on his successors. There's been a few, and they've been given the title of great. Most recently, I believe, our late great Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, the great. But the first among these would be Pope Leo, the, the, whom we honor today, Pope Leo the Great. Uh, one who literally put his stamp in history as one who truly exercised the role as the chief shepherd of the church in such a dramatic way. You have to know when uh, Leo, he was a deacon with the, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, he was under Pope Celestine I. And uh, he was entrusted, as the deacons were, their job was to be the extension of the bishop to the charitable outreach to all the means, the poor, the widows, the orphans. And Leo distinguished himself as an extraordinary deacon. In fact, he had such great administrative skills that he was one that was sent by the Pope to resolve a, a fight between two French rulers. And while he was there negotiating in terms of peace, Pope Celestine I died, and unanimously, Leo was elected the next Pope. I think people already there saw the greatness of this person. He was an extraordinary intellect. Uh, he, we have a lot of his writings in the Father of the Church, his wonderful sermons that uh, told a lot about the life of the Church in the 5th century. He was uh, one who spoke a lot about the liturgical life of the Church, the feasts of the Church, the life of the Roman community, <clears throat> but he was also one who was a, a great intellect in terms of theology. In fact, his tone to Flavian provided the key to unlock the great controversy of the monophysite heresy. Monophysicism was a heresy saying Jesus just had one nature, mono, one, thesis, nature. That Jesus had one nature, one person. And that is not what we believe. We believe Jesus was two natures, truly God, truly man, with one divine person. That's our theology of faith. But there was a controversy raging from raging, raging since the time of uh, actually the Council of Nicaea, where the areas of his heresy about Christ was confronted, even though it took another five centuries to really combat that well. That areas that said that Jesus really wasn't God, he was a human being that had some divine attributes, kind of like a superman, but he really wasn't God. That was confronted, but then when you're trying to uh, talk about theology, putting something that's supernatural and divine into human language is pretty hard to do. You know, just recently we had the, um, the amendment, the pro-life amendment in Missouri, you know, to declare fertilized egg as a human person. A really a good thing to protect the unborn. But the problem was with that, and again, even a lot of experts on the Catholic side who are very, very pro license, it's hard to articulate language to accommodate all the different parties. It's very, very hard. And sadly, a lot of people voted against it because the opposition, the abortion, was one of the things going the way it is. And uh, they can pick on those areas that can be very vague. That's why in the church, uh, the first 500 years was really the fight for who is Christ, answering that question in the gospel today. Peter answered it, but what does it mean that you are the Christ? What does it mean that you are the Son of the living God? All that had to be hammered out in language that could be kind of accessible to our minds, at least to give us an understanding. So after Arianism came among the physicism, and then later um, Nestorianism, that sees the Jesus said that Jesus had two natures and two persons. A divine nature, divine person, human about nature, human person. All that had to be hammered out. This is the time of Pope Leo, lived in that fourth century guy in 461, so he was caught up in that. It was his tone to flaming that articulated the, the truth that became the actual uh, conciliar statement about Christ being two natures, one person at the Council of Chal Chalcedon. In 461, 451. So he was renowned for this incredible intellect that he had. And, uh, he's, he's very 
useful to read to understand our history and our development of theology as we articulate the truths of our faith. But he's probably most renowned for the fact that uh, he lived in a very tumultuous time. You got to know that the Roman Empire was beginning to crumble. The barbarians, and then, by the way, when the Roman Empire crumbled, uh, it, it sank into a lot of immorality. The people we call the barbarians from Africa or from the north, the Germanic tribes, they were actually much more moral than the Roman people. And uh, uh, oftentimes, the, the people, the Romans, would kind of side with the barbarians. Well, in the year 452, uh, or 435, uh, a new threat came to the Roman Empire. Already the barbarians were starting to crowd in on the Roman Empire. But out of the east came uh, a great leader called Attila, Attila the Hun. And he came from the Mongolia area. Actually, the, the, the Huns had been advancing at different times, making kind of a quiet peace with Rome at different times. Uh, in fact, they were often allies of Rome. It's kind of a loose alliance. In fact, when they used to walk the streets of Rome, uh, the Romans thought they were a real curiosity because they were short little bow legged men who walked like cowboys, you know. <laughs> And they smelled because they read in the shower because they really lived on their horses. They would sleep on their horses. I don't know, have you ridden a horse here for a long time? You know, I've ridden for a long time. It hurts your legs after a while, you know, you just get bow legged. And, and they literally lived on their horses and they were extraordinary warriors because they, uh, they rode these very fast, sleek, agile ponies from these steppes of Mongolia. They could turn in a dime like a, like a, a cow cutting horse. They were small and agile. And they just decimated their enemy because they could roar into the fight, quickly divide into divisions, divide your army, wheel around and get you to the backside before you can blink with an eye. They were that talented and they could shoot their bows and arrows, these powerful bows, with incredible accuracy riding on a horse. And it was extraordinary. Uh, opponent to the Romans. And so they moved across this great leader, Attila, across the Roman Empire from Mongolia, 6,000 mile trek over into France. They met opposition to France and actually were defeated in France. So they reversed their, their, their progress, came down into to Rome. And the Roman government, which was situated in northern Italy, uh, did like all great governments, they ran for their lives, <laughs> they abandoned the people. They just took off Ravenna, which was the capital of the uh, western part of the empire near Milan. They just took off a nice race to Rome. And uh, like we used to do when we were little kids, when the bully came, us little kids would step back and push our older brother frontward. And go, you followed him. Well, that's what happened to the, the Roman Empire, Roman Emperor of the West, you go to Eden. Remarkably, uh, Leo, undone, went out with his priests to meet this ferocious enemy who was camped out here in and about where we know Venice to be right in that area. And he, the, the story goes that he rode out on a white mule, a white donkey, a symbol. If you know our Lord rode on the donkey, a symbol of peace. He rode out only with his banner. And his entourage. And he met them right around the air modern uh, town of Prashira in Italy uh, by a big river there. And Attila was so impressed. This guy came not with weapons, but with uh, a conviction of faith, utter calm, that he rode out through the river to a middle island and called out, Who is it that comes to me? And he said, Leo of Rome, the Pope of Rome. He was so impressed that this dignitary would come out to meet him. They rode across in peace to the other side, and Leo negotiated a treaty. Now, what did Leo do? Uh, historians debate about it. In fact, I would recommend you read this in Nine Mok Bar Zars, a book called The Ten Dates. Uh, Kathy Gates, the Dates in History, there, Kathy, I don't know, she highlights one of the creed, uh, critical dates in history. Uh, probably he offered him. Uh, Tribute, like a ransom for the city. I mean, that was quite common. But most theologians also, a certain professor, uh, Mozart, uh, 
terms of that, he probably reminded him that Alaric, another great barbarian, came through. He died. That's what happened to people who attacked us. We died. And they were just superstitious enough that they, he took it to heart. Because, in fact, the matter up there in that area that was very swampy and people were dying of malaria. And so the combination of it being utterly impressed by this incredibly brave person uh, who showed no fear in the light of the greatest warrior of all time. And by the way, uh, he was a great warrior. Uh, he was actually captured, until he was captured by the Romans, and he was in prison in Rome. He learned Latin. So he knew Latin. And he knew all the ways of the Roman people. So he, he knew his enemy very well. Uh, but he was so impressed, maybe intimidated by his superstitious nature, certainly seeing people dying because of malaria, he turned around, took the tribute, and went, went home. Just a footnote uh, what happened to poor Attila. Uh, loved him and had a beautiful bride. Got married her, had a big party, and he was. Uh, he celebrated heartily because he was a hardly warrior and he uh, got drunk and his tiredness from the merriment and the, the wine and the drinking. He fell asleep, he had a nosebleed, and he choked in his blood and died. Oh my That's God. how it's going to die. Oh my know, a little nosebleed that, that choked his, uh, in his lung area because he was so asleep and drunk. It's amazing how the great warrior. Leo went back established uh, his position in Rome now rising up, you know, people have disdain for the government, absolute admiration for this extraordinary person. He uh, helped again be established later on. Jedi would come through another barbarian and he would he couldn't buy him off totally, uh, but he presented a huge uh, pillaging and uh, raping of Rome as normally would have to be. He kept it to a minimum. He would die in the year 461, Pope Leo. What was significant about the day, according to Professor Diamond Moat, Tsar, is this that up to then the Roman Empire kind of had fallen into a, a lot of paganism and everything. And when it came down to it, uh, it was Christ that prevented the destruction of Italy and the Roman Empire. Not any pagan gods, not superstition, not the religion of barbarians, it was Jesus Christ. And Leo hammered that home also because he turned back this ferocious enemy. Uh, we can give thanks that uh, Italy and all that area didn't become uh, uh, just a subsidiary or tri tribute, uh, tribute nation to uh, Asia, that they preserved the Roman Empire. That's why Professor Mozart said this is so significant. And it is. But more significant to us is the fact what he hammered home. What we hear in the gospel today. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, the true Son of God of human nature. Not just something articulated in dogmatic language that we can articulate who is Jesus, but hopefully he becomes the Lord and Savior of our life because he's the Lord and Savior of, of Leo's life. And it was that deep faith that led the incredible peacefulness within him, the incredible wisdom and courage that he demonstrated worst of times, when everything was falling apart and still alone in the breach and held things together and rallying the people and especially you in the midst of all to look out for yourself and to look out for the good and especially the poor. Always that way. And it can really challenge us in our time and age because brothers and sisters, we have other barbarians come. It's called the second progressive left. I'm not talking about Republican and Democrat. I'm talking about second and progressive left that has led to the absolute most horrific kinds of movements in history. It is the progressive, secular, godless left that produced all the worst kinds of supposedly reformations and revolutions, starting with, uh, I mean, go back 200 years to the uh, French Revolution, moving on into uh, fascism and Nazism and communism. It all comes out of the same God of the sector. And this is the barbarian uh, threat that's coming, not in terms of necessarily arms, though every time you see it raised, they, they always do things violent with the revolutionary mentality of the mob. But it's something that's gotten into our people, and they've slowly infected and revised history, kind of convinces all kinds of lies 
By the way, there's another great book. If you want to get it, it's called The Seven Lies. Uh, again, about the Catholic Church. Every Catholic I know and know very well because it's lies against on a progressive secular left. Everything from the fact that uh, you name it, that uh, for the more modern times, Pope Pius XII, someone totally uh, didn't care about the Jews and uh, he was a very bad pope. Crazy. Crazy. That the, that the church didn't care about uh, women. That the church promoted slavery. That was a church that, uh, with the Inquisition and, and all the millions of people supposedly that left sick and killed. Uh, not so. The black legend that, that, that Spain, led by the church, got over to this very wonderful civilized country on uh, the continent called Edens, north, south, of, uh, southern, south America, uh, North America, Central America, South America, that these wonderful, beautiful, noble savages who were so sophisticated, so they were so kind. And then the Spanish came and, and just wiped them out with their diseases, deliberately infecting them with all. That's what you hear. It's a lie. You know, I love my, 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 my less kind of stuff. I said, all oh, those noble, wonderful people that <laughs> rip your heart out of the whole world. <laughs> Throw you down a, a, a step pyramid, a, that kind of people. But you see, we gotta be on the learn. We gotta start educating ourselves. In fact, uh, after reading um, a set of lines in the Catholic Church, I'm gonna propose a letter to Diane Mozart to tell her what a wonderfully strange she is, but she encapsulated very simple language. All of us, I'm not a historian. I'm an amateur, but I love reading history, and, and it would be good for us to learn. I'm gonna ask her if she could put her book into a, some video presentations, DVD presentations. That can articulate different lies because this is stuff we gotta get to our young people who are going into high school and college and fed by the progressive left, these lies, and we kinda fall into it. And you gotta be careful. Because the whole thing is to undermine what they need most, and that's this. What Leo loves, Jesus, and holy faith, and everything that is connected to them. It is Jesus and Holy Faith that has produced all that is noble and good and wonderful, that we know is beautiful. We can talk about music and art or architecture or literature or schools or universities or hospitals or hospices or orphanages or law, civil, international law, science. Everything came out inspired by faith. And we ought to treasure that and keep it from being eroded. Lee will be the first to say, do it. Do it now. Great faith and courage. Amen. Amen. Amen.